now we get now we're connected there we go mike we're on cool man yeah the video mike, what did you say is the video as good or not the video you know the video and audio is good ladies and gentlemen welcome the great michael Perez cisneros we've had about 10 false starts much like a real recording session yeah wow uh, <laughs> not one of mine no no not one of mike's um <laughs> Yeah. No, no. It happens. It happens to the best of us. Yeah, there we go. I got rid of some some buzz there. I'm trying to be like you over here. I got like my one microphone and my hundred dollar uh, interface, and I think I'm Michael Perez Cisneros. Oh, believe me. Yeah, you don't. You know, you're doing fine. <laughs> you're probably better off with the hundred dollar interface. Hundred dollars versus the hundred thousand dollar preamp. Um, if you don't, if you, if you don't know about Mike, uh, I'm gonna let him talk about himself, of course, but he's one of the preeminent uh, improvised music and jazz engineers in New York City, and he's uh, produced and engineered a lot of great records and a lot of the you know people on the forefront of the music. And uh, yeah, tell people. So you're from New York by way of Miami. Yeah, I was, I was a kid, a kid growing up in New York, and uh, you know when my parents got. My dad's Cuban, so the proper thing for Cubans to do other than going back to Cuba is go back, go to Miami. <laughs> so we, have, we went to Miami, and um, I grew up mostly there, like uh, my later you know, teenage years and uh, high school and college. Um, but yeah, you know, I spent a little time at Berkeley College Music, and I lived in Seattle for a little while. But uh, mostly, uh, mostly, I would say the towns I know the best are Miami and New York. So uh, that's sort of... I guess where I'm from, and now I've got a place down here in Nashville, so I spend a lot of time down here if I can. And lately, I've been spending a whole lot of time down here because right. of the state of New York. And um, yeah, it's great to be down here. I mean, we narrowly missed a tornado almost hit us like a week before this COVID nineteen thing started. Yeah. So my my place is was missed by seven hundred feet. You know, like a building across from us destroyed so it's pretty good but we're i'm happy to be here people are great so it's unbelievable man what happened when you showed me you know the pictures of what was happening like on the block next to you I, and that yeah. place that we went to see the music and get the coffee and stuff that one time i was down there it's it's unbelievable that that's like two blocks from where you're at yeah i mean it's kind of a thing that when you grew up in the northeast um i mean a lot of places in america other than the kind of the midwest or the mid-south West kind of mid, mid south kind of areas. I mean, this that exists. That's a real thing. Like I remember the first time I heard a tornado alarm, and nothing came of it. It was like a year or two ago when I was down here, and I was like, "What's that alarm?" I go, "Oh man, that must be a tornado alarm." I, I didn't even know that. Right. That was it, you know. But yeah, it's uh, people deal with it, and it, it's happened. I think the last time that hit this neighborhood was um, I'm in East Nashville. The last time it hit this neighborhood was like 20 years ago, 19 more than 20 years ago, like 1998. And they got through it, and people are awesome here, man. I mean, I've, I've run into people that, like, um, you know, I run into people that I'm, I know or friends or acquaintances, and I'm like, hey, what? Oh, I see that you, you know, windows broken in your house, or your house looks okay. And they're like, yeah, the house looks, the house is great. I've had people, I was, they're like, I was out on, out of town on the road when this happened, and I came back, and my windows are all boarded up. And then he's like, I don't even know who did it. Like, some random neighbor decided, well, I'm going to board up this guy's windows. So Southern house. hospitality, man. So I think I think yeah. there's a thing about that that's that's a real thing. Like people in the South are, you know, say what you will about there's there obviously there's been issues historically with uh, of course, yeah, yeah, in the South and stuff. But overall, I mean, everybody you meet is is you know, it's like anywhere. It's like you know, if you hear bad things about any group of people in general, that's like that's sort of like not really reflecting the reality. The reality is that most people are decent folks. You know, no matter where you're from know in the world you know most people you're gonna run into no matter what neighborhood you into it you visit no matter what town you visit no matter, no matter what country you visit they're gonna be good people and then there's some people that mess it up for for us for everyone you know, so. yeah totally i mean unfortunately is really the word i should be using yeah so what are you good what are you doing down in i'm up in new hampshire at a, a friend of uh, my ladies and i uh, natalie and duncan they're great and uh, Dunks is a chef, and Natalie works in the business world. I'll, nice. I'll leave it at that. Um, like Alyssa, because I don't want to give away specifics about anybody except jazz musicians on our podcast. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm up here. You know, I've got 
basics focus right midi controller electric bass upright uh exercises to keep them writing and composing uh we you know we filmed one of these podcasts last week with benny it's obviously not the same as doing it in person which we all will you know once this is over i'm going to keep them going but i filmed a couple you know the first one came out with orlando and yokin and people can check that out those of you who are going to watch and listen i'll probably put this on my youtube channel pretty soon and then rip rip the audio and put it on um buzzsprout and we'll be on apple podcast soon but I mean, I'm just, I think I'm doing what everybody else is doing, you know, working on a record from home. And that was one of the first questions I was going to ask you is how has that affected your industry? Whereas, you know, there will always be blowing sessions like Van Gelder style or Blue Note where people want to come in and play tunes and they're they yeah. play together. But now a lot of quote unquote, whatever you want to say, jazz, bam, whatever you want to call it, improvised music. Now a lot of it has an r&b vibe or a singer songwriter vibe it's just becoming more modern recording styles and a lot of people are doing their stuff like also by the fact that these things exist in your home you will do what is done best what is easiest to do in your home obviously it's not easy to make an awesome sounding record with six guys in your living room playing live but it is easy to make a record where you have to overdub a bass part put down a keyboard part and do stuff like that so i think that's part of the reason in a way that almost fuels a um even if there's a propensity for somebody want to do music like that it even fuels it more because it's like you're going to have people going like dude i can do this at home i can i can make this kind of music at home easily it's a little harder to do and you know you might start working with a drum machine or you know samples and stuff like that where because it's there it's in front of you it's a creative tool and i always encourage people i mean from my perspective i think you know i mix records and i and and it's a changing industry i mean you make Guys like me make less money oftentimes, depending on the case, but a lot of times less money than they used to because it's like there's less work, um, there's less studios. Um, The studio itself, because people, you know, have their own spots at home, um, you know, it's, you don't need, you don't need a big studio for everything. And you, you haven't for a while, I think, even since I was younger. I mean, I did most of my recordings when I was younger at home i mean i was on that beginning of that revolution you know what was that in the beginning of that revolution what was that for you me that was i mean for me like i only worked in a studio and i worked in studios in the 80s even like and and i i worked in the studios a studio named sync studios in miami and there's a guy named frank frank perlestra who owned that studio and he was um he was awesome and i was a kid i was like 15 14 and he was like he would let me go and record there for like, yeah, it's gonna be like five bucks an hour to do whatever you want. So, you know, I had like 20 bucks, 30 bucks a week. Go in there for a few hours and I learned a ton of stuff from him. I learned, the most important thing I learned from him was sort of like the idea of making records and finishing records and putting stuff out. I think that's um, that's an important thing that people actually get stuff out there. That I think that's why I never discourage people. I mean, I done a great record now that just got picked up that you actually, you, you, you had a big part in. Uh, that girl, that woman, uh, Christiana Romer, her record got picked up by Sunnyside. Oh. She, yeah, and it came out great. She went home and bought a decent, I mean, I, I think that's an important thing too, like get some good gear, get as, as good of gear as you can afford. If you can afford 200 bucks, we'll spend 200 bucks. If you can afford $1,000, you can get something really pretty good sounding. You know, if you spend $2,000 and you start getting, a, you start two, 3,000 bucks, you start getting somewhat indistinguishable if you set it up right from what you can get out of a studio. I mean, it's not quite the same, but in terms of sound, sound quality, you can get something. So she got something, she spent a little bit of money, got some stuff used, got a mic, she redid all her stuff. She did all the stuff, we did all the stuff she didn't like. We, you know, I, she'd bring it in, we'd, we'd use it. And it was great, man. The record came out real nice because of it. And it wouldn't have come out if it was, you know, there wouldn't be a budget to do that. That's, and that's the session with me and Addison and Aruda, right? Addison Fry and Adam Aruda. And that was sweet, man. It came out real nice. Everybody sounded great. Um, it's a fun record, you know. So, so she's getting signed to a, you know, for for jazz for our purposes, a big label in New York. Like, you know, Sunny Side's a label that puts out really cool records, and and you know, we kept our budget down by doing that. And I mean, that's the thing. It's like I feel like for me, the idea of a recording studio, um, or even me working with an engineer mixing your record, it's it's like going to a restaurant. It's like you can you can cook at home. You know, you can make yourself a nice meal at home. But I think a lot of times people go to a 
studio, I think it, it's just the, you get an experience, you know, you get, um, if, you, if a studio is doing it right, you get a good experience. You, know, you get an experience that you're like, wow, this is great. I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to worry about that. Like this person's getting this great drum sound. I don't have to like, you know, okay, I don't have to run back to my computer and hit play or record. I don't have to make sure the Wi-Fi connection between my iPad and my computer so I can link it and hit play is cool. Like all these things, yeah. like again, it's like going to a restaurant. Like you, right. you, you know, if you're into steaks and stuff like that, you're gonna get an awesome steak at a steakhouse. And that's hopefully what a few, and you can't really do it the same, quite the same at home. And, and you definitely can't have the same experience because yeah. your whole apartment is smoky. You know, all these things happen that, that you don't, really want so um when you're cooking something like that so it's when you're cooking up a recording i think it's the same thing it's like when you're cooking when you're cooking up that recording yeah yeah i mean i don't know i think people good people to work with it's, it's like anything it's like people will bring their experience to help people make records and i think to me i like making records so i'm, I'm happy like i'm mixing a few projects right now you know remotely from Nashville and Nashville from people in different continents you know and it's in and you know it's cat from new orleans a cat in, in Europe, a cat, you know, I mean, it's, so it's, there's people, you know, somebody in upstate New York. So it's cool. It's like, it's fun. And I can, I can be a little more chill about things. It's like, Hey, don't worry about an hourly charge. Let's, let's figure this out. I'll, I'll, I'll get you, what do you need this by? Okay. And then I can sit around and just do it when I want to do it, you know? Right. right. Um, so it's helpful. I mean, you know, we all bring like, you know, you get somebody to play a bass on your record, but you, maybe somebody wants you to play their bass on the record. So I think that's the main thing, how it's, affected things it's like i think people that have something cool to offer um in terms of a valuable product a valuable a valuable service to give to people i think those people are going to be sort of okay um the studio industry is definitely on the decline i mean it's not going to it's not what it was and it, and their studios are going to continue to close i mean it's that's the reality um it's going to be a different world you know in the, i mean right now there's studios that are really threatened in new york i know for a fact you know it's like We'll see after this is all over if all those studios that we are familiar with being around will still be around. What what is happening with during the pandemic? All right, obviously we all have social distancing guidelines, which I I hope that everybody is following, and I don't know the exact timing of when this will be released, but it's allowed some people to do duo live streams or solo live yeah. streams, even some full bands if they've they're all young and they're yeah. not going to be around older people. Whatever precautions they're taking. Is yeah. the studio scene in New York still recording right now? Uh, my, the studio I work out of, which is Big Orange Sheep, is doing nothing. There's nothing going on there. That's all you can speak for, I guess. He, the owner, Chris, who still holds up in New York, he's just doing like I'm doing. He's missing projects. He's doing things for people. Yeah, it's, it's dead. I mean, there's nothing going on. I mean, nobody's making their rent payments. It's, there's no way it's possible. Um, it's just, it's... It, depending on how things shakes out, this could be a real major thing. Like it could be, like you know how people are like, oh my, all these restaurants are gonna be gone. This is gonna be gone. Yeah, and a lot of your recording studios might be gone. You know. If, yeah, it's funny how stuff. people go. Re you know, oh, restaurants better to, and they don't even think about the, the live music venues or the recording studios, which they inevitably will notice if anything happens. But what's the deal yeah. with the? With I mean, the it's sort of like you know, there was a time in human history, that you know, the, that were the dark ages, you know, like uh, where the only people that, I mean, somebody's probably going to correct me on this, but the, the, the only people that, at least from what I understand, were that had all the, you know, all the, the, the histories of the Greeks, science, philosophy, philosophy, literature, you know, the church held on to some of that stuff while the whole world just went to hell and people forgot about how to do math, <laughs> like science, that all disappeared. For a minute and until like people started re rediscovering these documents i feel like to me it's like home recording is awesome and but it's sort of like a real studio like we got some studios down here in nashville that are amazing like yeah you know i think we do an amazing job at the studio where i'm at in new york in terms of this out the whole culture of it like the, the staff and yeah. and the owner and you know it's just great you know and you get this really high bar you know and i totally. really feel that's the only thing that kind of bums me out about, you know, this is what I do for a living. So for me, it's important to make something amazing. You know, it sounds great, you know. Yeah. Some artists it is too. But ultimately, I will say this. I will, I will definitely um, give into the idea that the most important thing is that you put out stuff as a musician, as an artist. It's not, it, I'd love to be the guy who does it all. But in reality, um, the important thing is like there's, there's amazing music 
who had the history of jazz. And it's like, and rock, and that's recorded terribly. That's awful, <laughs> you know? We love those records because the yeah. music is, you know? So. Exactly. So if you do, it's great that people can relate to. If you want to say, hey man, why doesn't it sound as good as the stuff you do? Well, I spent a lot of money and a lot of time, and, and, it, and it does sound a bit hipper, um, or a lot hipper sometimes, but sometimes that's not the most important thing. Sometimes the most important thing is to, to put out stuff, to put out music, to make sure the world knows you exist. I mean, I, I, I run into a lot of artists, I've probably talked about this in the past with you that you know, they're in their mid thirties, they've been in New York for 10 and 15 years, 12 years. And like, I haven't put out a record yet. And I'm like, that's weird to me. It's like, you've got to, nobody other than people in New York will know who you are on any level. And maybe that's okay for some people. Some people don't mind that. Some people don't want to, they just play the music for the music. And as long as they can play their games, they're cool. But I think most people want to have a little bit of a hope for like, you know, expand their careers, have yeah. people work on their artistry and they want to have people like hear it. You know, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I think there's a, this ethos in jazz that a lot of people are like, no, 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 you know, don't pander to people. Don't, don't worry about the public. But I know you love playing for people. You know, it's part of what's really enjoyable. Yeah. Like touching people and going, oh man, this is people being excited about what you do. That's, I know you love, that's one thing I know, knowing you as long as I've known you, that's a big thing for you. And I think that's a big thing for a lot of people, and it should be, I think, in my opinion. You know? Totally. So, and, sp and speaking of which, I just texted Jensen to see if he wanted to join in, because Zoom, you can have three people join in. See, he just texted me. He'd love to, but he's doing something. He's filming something right now. So next time. And he's out of L.A., you know, and he says it's, it's, it's a little tough right there. But at least, you know, I mean, for him, you know, he's enjoying the weather. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. Enjoy. And I'm, I'm sure he'll be able to talk to us more about that. Yeah, it's more, it's more native to his, uh, his native weather. It's more back to his... Yeah, uh, I think so. I think he, he's just having a good time. And also, I think there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I'm in Nashville a lot now, and I, I love it, man. People are great. It's great to have a change. I mean, I've been in the same place in New York for years. So for me, spending a little more time down here... But I'm you sort of did, forced you to did so much profound work in New York, if you look at it. I mean, so most people... I think most people in the jazz scene or improvised music or whatever are found out about you probably from hardcore. That was probably where, and that was one of your first records, right? Kind of as a recording engineer. That was my first record people knew about. I mean, I was other records, you know, done, what did you I do did, before? Did a lot of stuff in Seattle. I did a lot of stuff, but nothing for anybody well known per se. Um, yeah. Nobody really well known, like, like local guys, like, local rock groups, local, a lot of local jazz things um, that never really saw the light of day. Because I was young. I mean, I was in, in my, my early 20s and just doing it as kind of a hobby because it's something, but it's something I did my whole life. So I knew, I was, you know, I knew about how to record records because I always did it, you know, from the tiniest, you know, I was really young to like a little cassette four track to like, wake it up from there. So it's, right. yeah, so hardcore was the first thing and, and hardcore was a really cool experience because of how, you know, it was, a record done in their home studio as well so that's sort right. of like that's the sort of thing that's really interesting now but back then we had kurt got a got a hold of a little bit of money from funding um from the label etc and he kind of hooked that up where he could actually i helped him build a studio i wired everything we did all this it's stuff. funny i look at his studio and i see so, some stuff and i'm like mike has that like i'll look i'll be like oh that's also mike has that you know that yeah little, like, no pretty. because you know it's, it's just like anything else like you know recording and just like anything is like, you know, I always bring up, I don't know what it is, I'm bringing up restaurants all the time, but it's like, you know, if I show you, <laughs> awesome hungry. If I show you an awesome restaurant, you're going to go, you're going you're gonna to be out one night in that same neighborhood with somebody who's like, yeah, let's go to this restaurant, it's real good. Like, you'll, because it's, it's the same thing with recording, like, there's mics, people that I'll hit people to, there's little computer things, there's little. Right. Oh, you've hit me to so much. That we all share with each other. Yeah a pile of stuff you've hit me to you know or if i hit you up when i was trying to figure out about um about i wanted you know i was crazy about the tube stuff because i did that cannonball steve miller yeah. show and they got me that b15 and i was like oh man i use a yeah. fishman preamp with the b15 and it was perfect with the tube and you were like well except for this db1 like you should really just get a di box and then you taught me about the impedance thing which i don't hear any bass players in new york talk about at all yeah. Well, I mean, it's all simple stuff. It's just, it's just stuff that I think it's like the internet is awesome in a way for information, but I, I wouldn't look at the internet as a library. It's kind of, a, the internet's kind of like a big garbage dumpster. It's like, <laughs> it's sort of like 
there is you find some gold in there, but there's also like what's this? Like is, oh, we like as you know. Say say that again. Our experiences. We, we lost you for a, we lost you for a second. It claimed. No, I said like I think there's a lot of good information out there as well, but it's hard to decide to sort that. You know, like I think for you to sort it for me. I mean, you you we're friends and and you trust me from that level, but also from the level of like you know well mike's done all these records so i'll listen to him i like his records I like his records are cool so he must know something so that's a reasonable thing to, to to listen to me maybe about certain things but i always i mean i've been talking to a sax player i'm friends with in new york and he's like trying to figure out what microphone to get and he's asked me and um he's asked everybody else too which is great you got to ask all your friends and yeah see what people are doing and I learn stuff through that. I, I always want to go, I mean, whenever I meet younger cats or cats that are just, I've met before, but what are you using? What do you, what's that? What is that? Is that, you use that for piano? Oh, that's really cool. Like I want to know because I think that's a way to get better. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's, I, I'm striving to get better, you know, that's the way all the best cats are. Like, you know, anybody I know that's getting better as a musician there. And awesome. I know you're like that, like with on the bandstand, like after a show, especially you play with a lot of older guys and you'll, you'll be like, I know you talk to them after the show and go, well, what should I do? What, what yeah. should I do? Well, some guys don't, you know, you learn as you get old. Sometimes you're younger and you're just, you know, or I'm still young, but I mean, I'd be like, hey, what do I need to work? And some guys are like, oh, just leave me. Leave me alone. Yeah. Like some guys. Well, I mean, to me, it's like, I feel like I owe, owe it to people. Like, I mean, I, I feel like I care about the people I work with and I care about, um, I care about the art, the recording arts, you know, like people, I love records. I always loved records as a kid. Um, and it's like, to me, that was my escape from anything bad in my life was like listening to a record, you know, listening to, you know, pop records or jazz records later on or whatever. And I was like, right. that's really great. You know, I, I always love doing that. So yeah. Um, but yeah, that Kurt record was, that was a big one, man. I mean, that was, that was when all of a sudden overnight, yeah. everybody's like, oh, you must know what you're doing. <laughs> So that was super funny. You're like, oh, MPC, they're 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 pro. yeah. You're the you know, and it's like, okay, I guess I knew that like a month before I worked on that Kurt record. I knew the same thing, but 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 actually, I did actually learn. I, I should not discount that. I did learn a ton of stuff by working on on, on hardcore, and even after that, we did uh, the remedy. We recorded that, and, uh, right? I did some initial mixing on that, and that was cool too. You know, it's like, and then Kurt took over a lot of the mixing duties on that. And, that was cool too. So all of that, man. I mean, that, my time at the you know, spending a week at the Vanguard recording there every night. Was, was oh cool. man, yeah. That and for fun. for our listeners that are, you know, I'm sure a lot of people know exactly who you're talking about. But if you're sort of uh, newer to the jazz scene or improvised music, we're talking about Kurt Rosenwinkel, who's our friend, the great genius Kurt Rosenwinkel, who's incredible. Yeah. And uh, Mike was a big part of a lot of those records that he did yeah, I think i've done a lot of stuff on, on, on quite a few of those records and i guess if anything i've done i kind of got to do a lot of guitar guy records that's like i mean i i grew up yeah. as a guitar player so i mean i got to do the next cat i did you know and i'm actually working on something for him now and it's um that guy from israel great great musician man um galat hexelman and yeah. he's a staple he's on the scene of, and I know he's in Israel, kind of laying low and keeping his family safe, which is good. And yeah, I'm, I'm working on his stuff. I've worked on five of his records. And then I've been lucky to work with your friend, your old friend, uh, Ben Jensen. Ben Jensen. Who's in LA right now. Um, You're the guitar guy. I mean, there's never a moment in any session where working with you, I've discovered that you were trying to like get some sort of different sound, whether it be with when we recorded with Kurt or we recorded with Ben or whoever it is, you've always got an immediate encyclopedic answer for how to get, Oh, well you want that kind of reverb. Okay. Well maybe we should put the, the cab over there and like, I mean, towards the wall. experiential stuff, you yeah. know, and I think that goes back to the, you know, Michael's restaurant of recording. It's like, basically <laughs> it's like you, the only thing I have, I mean, this information is out there, right? You can see what mic to buy or what piece of gear to buy. But using it and, and stuff like that, it really does help. And it's, it helps make a session go by fast. Yeah. You know, like if you have somebody who's quick, can quickly go, okay, I know what's up. Let's change this. And also, no, it's weird. Like you learn when to like go, well, we're not going to work on this. We're going to do this instead because this is going to be, this is going to take 45 minutes. And if we have to sit here doing this for 45 minutes, 
that's a waste of time and that's nobody's gonna like that nobody's right. gonna when you're like it. well just record the signal and then we'll reamp it like when you're doing a, a day like or you I, I don't i'm not i mean i'm it's an interesting thing because i definitely am like a guy who um no you take your time like you never you're always if we have time to do the most quality route if there's any chance of that yeah you're gonna go for that always you're always gonna take and i've gotten fairly good i think at doing that in the sense of like for me like i always marveled at the fact that all these records we love like especially the jazz genre but even motown and stuff like that that wasn't like that the sounds were gotten when they recorded it it wasn't like well we'll fix that later it, it always kind of irks me a little when i'm in a recording session i hear engineers saying like we'll worry about that later i say no oh, let's just worry about it now i mean if we can when i say like we, let's worry about it now hopefully my fixes are going to take three minutes or four minutes it's not going to take like five hours that then yeah worry about it later but in general i want it to sound like a record i want it to sound like i mean i've had you say funny things to me like dude i mean the rough mix is really good maybe it's better than a mix oh yeah like, didn't, didn't you say that ari honig said that to you that he was like damn your rough mix yeah, is killing well, like you shouldn't mix it phenomenon that people do get attached to their rough mixes they hear a rough mix in the session but my rough mixes tend to sound really close to the way i want the mix to sound so sometimes i've learned to back off and learn to like like that's something I've learned in the last year, like from feedback, like I've gotten from you, maybe Ari was one of those cats, a couple other cats. It's like, I'm like, I don't need to do anything. I, I, I had vision and understanding and I worked with the artists who get a really good sound right on, right off the bat, you know? And I, that's the thing, like, you, oh, that's, let's try, try a different mic, let's try this, let's try that, you know? It's funny, like I look at the amount of mics I have and I don't really own that much vintage stuff, but some of the stuff I've had for, you know, over 20 years right. ago when I was really young and it's like, it's old and it's i've had them for years like i've had i have like 30 ribbon microphones weirdly somehow i got a hold of over the years and they're there and i use them and they give me choices and it's cool it's like anything it's like it's like you know big bigger box of crayons that way it's like you get to do you get to do more stuff and and, and if you use it you know they're just tools like you would never get a hammer to do what you need to do with the screwdriver you would never you know it's just that's just how it is you know and I work on it from that perspective a lot, I think, you know. What, what, do you, what do you notice from being on the other side of the glass in the recording studios? Like, what do you think musicians could improve on? Like, either being prepared or something that you notice in the studio that you've learned? Like well, watching. I mean, we do, run into, we do run into sometimes where I think there's people you wish maybe they rehearsed a little more. Um, but that's not, always in, that's not always easy, especially in a place like New York. Yeah. Um, a weird thing that I, this is kind of almost comical. This is like, I'm giving away, like, it's not a secret. Everybody should know this, but it's a funny thing because I say this a lot to people. It's like, whoever the leader of the group is, have a notepad in the room with you. Because when you say, when somebody says to me, oh yeah, okay, the bridge, remember that sax part on the bridge? I don't think you quite nailed that. Um, we're going to have to go check that later. Um, and then they don't remember. Oh, that's right. Uh, we didn't check that. We were supposed to see if that was yeah, right. Inserts, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think when people take little notes, this small, you know, I mean, I take, I take, I tend to like, if I notice a session, if I'm not sure if a guy's kind of take notes. And this is another thing that I think is a thing that a lot of people, engineers down here take a lot of notes from what I understand. Yeah. And I do it a little bit too, but I feel like we take notes in the control room. I always have an assistant. And anytime somebody says, hey, that was a great take, I, my assistant already knows to so like mark that down on the computer or on a piece of paper, take three. That was a take they liked, you know? Um, yeah. So that way, because then they'll come in, it's like, Alex well, Haley you. always had a notepad going the, the whole time. Huh? Alex Haley always had, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Alex Haley always had a notepad going the whole time. That day was Yeah, and we do that. The current day that made it so easy. I we started, I mean, I did, I've done that since the beginning. And, my original uh, assistant that I spent a lot of time with, a um, cat named Kevin Frias, he we did oh, the yes, same thing. Yes. It seems like obvious to me. Like, I feel like I would hope there's thousands of people, wherever many people listen to this, going, you know, that it might be an engineer, it might be a recording, uh, work at a recording studio or, or recorded at a studio. Of course, that's, everybody does that. Don't you know that? I don't know if everybody does that. I, don't, I, I feel like people, people don't pay enough attention. And I can see it oftentimes when I get work that are done at other places. I'm like, oh, this is like kind of not documented really well. And it's, it's like anything. It's like the clearer you are, it's, a, it's about communication and all aspects of life. If you're communicating well, 
generally that leads to more fruitful relationships, either be it with music or be it with your friends or your girlfriend or, or, or whoever, you know, it's like, it's, it's being communicative and understanding the level importance of communication is, is, is powerful, you know, and I think that that's one of the things. And I think sometimes people, um, people are just, yeah, people rely a lot. I, I, the idea of rehearsing and stuff is big because I think people do rely a lot on the fact like, oh, we can fix that. We can fix that. We can fix that. And it's like, I, I love it because that gives, that's giving me a job, right? That I can fix that. But on another level, it's like, I want people to be like, you know, I want people to be like, no, nah, it's great when it's a great take. And the, uh, speaking of, you mentioned Ari Honig. Every time, I'm, almost every time I've done a session with Ari Honig or one of his groups, it's like, no music stands. There's no, there's, everybody knows the music. People just play it. And it's amazingly cool. You know? Yeah, his but, his groups are so tight. Everybody's so prepared, and they play at Smalls, and they're like they got it all yeah. together in the parts of the songs. Like every time I've ever seen him lead a band, it's like really an ensemble. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that comes from the top down. You know, I think I think people people have to like realize the importance of like you know a lot of times people will hire like a famous person or somebody very well known in the jazz scene for their record, yeah. and sometimes it makes amazingly great sets for sure but sometimes it's like if you've got some guy and you we've talked about this when especially a few year, years back when you were younger because you would be sort of i don't want to say the victim of this but you you experience this where it's like you play like 20 gigs with somebody and they're like i'm gonna make this record I, I, i'm not gonna use you though on bass oh, and it's I, know. A I know exactly what you're talking about too yeah that used to happen to me all the time that still happens to me listen i get it you know, people want to get their music out there in the improvised music band. And sometimes it makes sense, right, to get somebody else. Sometimes, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it's a massive learning experience. I mean, anytime I've gotten to play with older musicians, wh whomever they are, I I'm always learning and I understand that. But sometimes it does feel a little bit like some of those bands you see on festivals where somebody put a bunch of names on a dartboard and like they threw a dart at it and they were yeah. like, oh, this person, this person. And like, do you get the same connection? Working yeah, I but that's the thing, like sometimes I really do think there's times, I don't know what the, I wouldn't hazard to guess a ratio of times because I think it depends on who you are. But I guarantee you there are times where just getting your guy who went to the school with you, who's been playing all those gigs with you, that might have been the better move for the music. Now, again, we go into this well, thing. Why not, why not mix? Why not? That's what I think. I think yeah. if you have somebody like me and Kyle Poole, or I should say Kyle Poole and I, and Aruda or somebody like that, you know, we, Jensen, we have a really special thing. So when we would get to play with people that were older or a, a pair of somebody else who had a thing, you know, like Lewis Hayes and Sam Jones were a pair that matched up with Cannonball and Joe Zawano or whatever you're thinking. Like, there's no reason. But I think guys my age, I was always shocked, like, when I would hold down the late nights for Kyle and I would see the other young guys leading bands. I'm like, why don't you ask somebody like Kikoski or older, whoever they are, to try and learn from them? You know what I mean? Well, I think it's, I think there's, I think that, I mean, I don't want to blame people's ages, but I think that, I think it's a thing that there's so much information out there now. You can see any piece, you can have every piece of music that you would ever have any interest in hearing. You could get, you could spend a day and a half or two at home and get a half, get, and compile it all. Like you can get it all, you know, one way or the other. Download it, listen to it. We well, can't listen to it all at once, but you download it all. You can have yeah. a lifetime of stuff, and I think that lulls people a little bit into thinking that. Well, I know, I know what's up because I have, I have, I, I've heard all this stuff. But you know, sometimes when you have, like, you know, I know, I know the story of guys that are like, you know, Kikoski days and stuff like that. Like these dudes would buy a record and they'd wear out the record. You know, that's yeah. how much they'd listen to the record. So I think that. Things came by. I mean, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm really sounding like some guy from the 30s who's like, and when we went to school, it was snowing every day, and we went, <laughs> we went uphill both ways, you know, like, so, which is ridiculous. But I really do think that it's like everything. It's like, it's great to record at home, but you owe it to yourself to learn as much as about recording and how to do it. Yeah. But maybe you don't. Maybe you just want to play the bass. Maybe you just want to play your horn. So maybe you don't want to sit around reading about like you know how the best way to minimize phase phase cancellation how to do that phase uh issues how to, no, how to do I, do, I do i definitely do with the phase cancellation thing that's something that bass players 
but that's good. But that's good. And what, here's the thing that's interesting. That's why people are talking and have friends calling you now. A bunch of people, three or four different people, and they're like, Mike, what would you do with this? How do you do that? Like, what would you do with that? And it's like, it's great because the reason why they're doing it is now they have time. They're not always hustling, but that's the thing about New York, and especially in New York, but uh, a lot of places I'm sure too, where it's like, yeah. everybody's struggling to make a living. So if you're struggling, I know how your life, I mean, if you, I can't even keep up with what you're doing. Like, I'll call you, like, you might call me in the morning once in a while, be like, yo, what are you doing? And like, I'm, and, and then I'll, I'll, you know, I know you're at home when you place that call, but within like five or 10 minutes, I hear like street noises and you're like, yeah, I'm about to go to the gym and I'll call you later. So like, yeah. hey, you're just on the move. You just got to be, be on the move, which is what is making this whole thing so tough for so many musicians. But like, you know, to my friends that are musicians at home, I just want to throw in like, I think we're going to put this up before, you know, ho hopefully after this is all up, but it could be during um, the, the pandemic. But like, you got to create a schedule for yourself, even if you're in the house. That's how you're yeah. going to, that's how you're going to stay sane. That's what every comedian's podcast is saying. That's what everybody. So I'm around like three other people. One of them's a chef. Okay. I know lunch is at this time in the morning. I'm going to like do this. And then after yeah. lunch, I'm going to do this and do this. And then on Thursday, I'm going to change it up and do this. And if you're not doing that right now, like you're just going to be totally toast. I mean, it depends yeah. on what kind of person you are too. Some people don't, they just kind of don't even need a schedule or whatever. They can just be. Yeah. Here. And I think, I think we live in a time where I think it's just a different time. Because I was watching, there's a great documentary um, on country music that Ken Burns did. Oh, and it's funny, really? talking about like Patsy Cline and Hank Williams Jr. Yeah. And this just struck me because they're talking about like, well, Hank did this and he had a hit. And then, you know, he got married and he had two kids, but they got divorced. And then they, um, he was in the army for two years. And then he got back and he was doing, I mean, I'm not, I don't know what happened to Hank, but this right. is, the story is sort of like that. And same with Patsy Cline. She got married, she had a kid, she did this, she went touring for a while, and then she did this, and then she did that. And these people died when they were like 27 years old. But it sounds like they were living this giantly long... Yeah, that's like when you look at somebody's like Coltrane died at what, 40 or 41, and you look at his discography. Yeah. I was looking at it the other day, I was like, holy shit. Like, like, like Charlie Parker, you know? Oh, yeah, exactly. Like Paul Chambers is really one that blows my mind because he died at 33. Yeah. And he's like, but you, you think about, think about, that's why I always tell people. And you know, who told me this years ago was um, that bass player, uh, Omer Avital. Yeah. Who tell man. me, who'd call, because we were putting out a ton of, I was working with him for a minute where we were putting out a ton of records. And he was always saying, um, you know how many records John Coltrane put out in 1957? And he put out a few on his own name, maybe or two or three. I don't know. Somebody's going to have to check the facts on that, but a few records on his own. But I think he was on 27 different records that year. I mean, and the granted, things have changed. So if you want to be on 27 records in one year, you're going to have, to, you you're going to have, have some thick pockets. Without a label or something, right? Yeah. But yeah. But that's, that's the vibe. And that's what I, you know, that's the only reason is like we, you and I spent so much time of me like meandering and trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted in the studio. And, you know, I, nobody can afford to keep doing that unless you, you've got wealth coming from somewhere. So, but now. No, but also I think, you're going to get to a medium for yourself because as we get an experience, like now, yeah, you, have, you, you can do stuff on your own. You don't need me. Like before it used to be, you needed me to do almost anything. Like, but now you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm learning these programs. I'm learning logic. I'm learning. I've got, a, a, okay, Mike, I've got a, a decent interface and do some stuff. So now you're learning that. So now you can do all the experimenting you want, but you're going to get to a point. Even my prediction would be this, and you're going to get to a point where you're going to still have a desire to be efficient, more efficient than you are today, because that's hopefully we always want to get better. Right, right. You're going to be more efficient. So when you, you have those five hours or four hours, you can get more things done. So that's how it is. So you're going to bring that. And, and then in turn, that if you do have to go to a studio, you're going to be more, you're going to be ready to be efficient. And, you know, it's, yeah, but, and it's, here's, here's the thing about this, this whole pandemic break is that there, there is a lot of pressure. First of all, get off your phones don't be on Instagram. Like there's just so much and the news, it's just so dark between the yeah. two. And there's so much pressure on you to like, you know, reinvent yourself during this time, you know, and I did, you know, I watched the miles movie and he was caught up in for five years and he wasn't playing and he reinvented. I mean, there's different yeah. ways to spend this kind of time off and you can consider about that. But, you know, 
it is a wonderful chance to regroup and rebuild, but also the more that we kind of acknowledge that this is crazy and insane, the more that you can actually move forward and I can wake, or at least for me, I can wake up the next morning and be like, okay, you know what? Yeah, this isn't my usual schedule, but I am going to sit down and learn about recording for yeah. four or five hours. And I am going to test mic placement in a room. I mean, cause it's not, it's things that to somebody who's a musician, you know, you're like practice, 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 listen, practice, practice, play, you know, but actually the amount you learn from anything involving recording yourself is just so massive. Yeah, I mean, you learn to hear things, you learn, but the interesting thing I find out, like, there's, a, there's this expression that's, uh, what is it, like, a, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, <laughs> which is kind of sometimes, <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before. which is sort of like, it, which I, but you have to get past it. I'm not saying this as like, well, don't try to do anything then, because you, if you think you know some stuff, because what happens is, and it's happened to me, like, I remember the first time I ever got, I was about to be like 20. 21 or something and at first I ever got a really good drum sound on a recording I was like oh man I know I, I took I didn't take pictures but I took like notes I measured things I was like okay I know exactly where to put the mics now it's going to be perfect so then I a week later rolled around as a different drummer and I, but I knew now I knew exactly what to do because I I took notes and I man it sounded terrible <laughs> it's exactly the same as I did it when I was playing. and I was like beside myself so that's another thing to learn is like I think even I do this, where if I go into a recording studio, I almost, unless there's an engineer that I feel is really inexperienced, if somebody's done records there that I know, I always go, I've, I do this now with, even if, if somebody's, if I go to a studio with a good assistant, that's a, not a studio I'm familiar with, I'll ask the assistant, like, what do you do? What do you do on, on a piano? What do you put on a piano? I don't roll in going, well, here's what we're gonna do, gentlemen. Like, I, I, just, I just go, I wanna know, because there's reasons why people do things. Like, I will use a certain darker type of, like, as a piano we have, that when we first got the piano, it was a voice in a certain way, that I'd want to use a certain type of mic on it. But now, it's funny, we went back to do a session, and I still fell, fell into my own trap. Like, I was like, well, we use this mic on that last session. It's going to work this time. And it sounded terrible, because the piano's changed a lot. There's been a lot of work done to this piano. So now, I have to use a completely different thing. But I think sometimes people get, like, real, like, pig-headed about it, where they're like, no, it works. I, I think this is home, and it works great. And it's like, I do, but this is not your home. This is now a different place. So we, we might want to try something different. And I, and I, but I'm always open. What I usually do is somebody says, I want this mic or that. I'll go, okay, let's put that up. And then I'm going to put my mic too that I think is good. Because I just, I just, if I, or if they're doing something really intriguing, I'll be like, huh, all right, let's try that. Sounds yeah, like take a step back and learn it. Stuff. I remember I did this. Yeah, I always, I mean, you have to, because I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. I'm here for the recording, for the musicians here. Right. I mean, I... To make me feel good. I mean, I want to feel good. That's nice. That's a, that's a good. Uh, that's a good like you know extra side effect to have. But I feel good about things. But I, the main, the main thing I'm using is using my skill set for is to make somebody else feel good. I'm not here to you know. Right. It's not about me. It's about them liking it, and it's about me going. It's about me like if they like it, something that's really bizarre, I'll bring it to their attention and go. Is that what you want? Is this why you want it that way? And they're like, Yeah, that's why I want it that way. That's why. I, you know, I mean, I did that. We got we we do things where I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I don't like it, but let's do that. And, and and I would say, as time goes on, the things I think I don't like from you get less and less, and I begin to trust. It's that's how a working relationship is. You begin to trust, like now, you me knowing that you're working on doing all this stuff. Just our relationship is built on a trust of like, yo, I, I trust Alex. He's been working well, on this my, stuff. My whole vibe at working on this new record at home is it's ultimately going to make it to you. Like I'm working it out and I'm going to edit and I'll take it to Alex Haley and we'll work on it and do that. And I want to be able to bring it to you at a time where it's like, okay, now we can be creative with it. It's all cleaned up. It's all like, it's almost like you're a chef. We keep getting back to Mike's restaurant. That should be the name of this, uh, this podcast. <laughs> but, but I want to- No, but it's kind of true. It's hey, kind of true. It's that season. way I'm not worried about or thinking about other and, things. And all that, and rather than you being like, dude, like, listen to this, there's burnt, like, this is fucked up over here, and like, that kind of a thing. But also... And you, and you know what? I guarantee you still will find stuff. Because when you have, like, you know, Alex is, is the old assistant from the studio who's a great engineer, great guitar player. Yeah. He's a great guitar. He's, he, like, builds guitars and stuff. He's great with all that stuff. And Alex is great. And Alex Haley I'm talking about now. And, and he, you know, yeah, dude, he knows what I know, but he'll miss something. And I've, I've always loved having him around people when I'm, like, doing something. He knows that he can come up to me like, yo, Mike, what about that? I'm yeah, like, oh, wasn't shit. there, like, some time where some shit was, like, out of phase, and he was like, yo, Mike, click, and you were like, oh, shit. I, I remember you telling me some story. Yeah, dude, that happens because nobody's perfect. 
Yeah. And sometimes when it's out of phase, you might want it to be out of phase. It's, there's times, it's rare, but, but there's times where, where things like if you listen to old David Bowie records or really cool pop records from the 70s and stuff, there's weird phase issues on those. But they're, Who they're was really the cool. guitar player with the pickups and the phase thing that that was like his sound? There's a bunch of dudes like that. There's a, well, Eric Johnson does that, but the main guy is Peter Green. From? From original Fleetwood Mac. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. He had Black Beauty with like three pickups. Maybe that's Frampton, but but Peter Green used to have the pickup flipped, and certain people like to flip the phase. Oh, so it's it is two pickups with. The, okay, yeah, no, I knew it was the dude from Fleetwood Mac, and Frampton had the Black Beauty. I think, I think with the, the Green was the guy, but again, somebody will, I'm sure will correct you if this is posted. No, it is, it is. It is. It is posted. It it got like you know I'm famous, Mike. It got 500 <laughs> downloads. <laughs> you're always you're always famous. I'm yeah, I'm I'm a legend of my own mind. No, you're oh no, you're like a legend. You you your your legendary status is growing as we speak. Yeah, I'm le- I'm legendary um in all for all the wrong. Places. That's why you got to be in the woods in no, New just, Hampshire. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm out here planning my to deep keep the throngs. Uh, what'd you say? To keep you got to be in the woods in New Hampshire to keep the throngs away. Yeah, from... there's so many people after me, and I'm out here working on my deep new shit, and uh, it's gonna. And you look me. very appropriate with that shirt. Sure, yeah, I do. I for, like for the people just listening, that's complete sarcasm. Mike and I are messing around. Yeah, but, my, but we, yeah, my, Alex and I do give each other a hard time a little bit. Once in a while. Uh-oh, wait, you disappeared. 